the people of God shall say amen. Welcome to the historic Trinity African Methodist Episcopal Church located here in the heart of Manning, South Carolina. Here at Trinity, we believe that God is our Father, Christ is still in the redemption business, and the Holy Ghost can do something about our situations. We greet you this morning, this afternoon, or evening, whenever you find yourself watching this broadcast, in the joy that we know simply comes from knowing who Jesus is. My father's children, we're so blessed and grateful for what God has done and what God continues to do as we celebrate the third Sunday in the month of December, the fourth Sunday in Advent. We are getting ready as we make our way towards the birth of the Christ child. Just by way of announcements, on the 24th Christmas Eve at 3 p.m., we will be releasing a virtual Christmas Eve worship experience. Once again, that is going to be on the 24th at 3 p.m. You'll be able to go to the church website, watch on our YouTube channel, or check us out on Facebook or our Instagram account. Follow us at, at Historic Trinity sc.org. Also, before we jump into the word, just by way of announcements, we are excited to be able to share that Trinity has gone mobile and we are getting an app. When the call goes out, we are asking that you would tell your friends, your family, and even yourself. Sometimes you got to remind yourself to download Trinity AME Church's church app. It will be out in the app store soon, preferably by the end of the year. And we're going to have some special instructions of how we want you to download that and how we want to share. We believe that even in the midst of COVID-19, God is calling us to go ye therefore into the world and to make disciples. And as we upgrade our technological capacities and our cameras here at the church, we are asking that you will continue to be in prayer with us, continue to be covenant partners with us through your stewardship by going to www.historictrinitysc.org. Click on the donate button and you can learn more about how you can partner with us through your giving to the members of Trinity who support us with their tithes and their offerings. I want to say thank you to the members who do not support us, but I want to start supporting us. Let me tell you, it is not too late to pay your tithes and your offerings. We pay a tithe and we give an offering. The tithe is the tenth. The offering is what we give beyond that. We know that these are difficult economic times. We don't want to downplay that. Let us know how you're doing. We'd love to hear from you. Call us here at the church. Many of you are getting our automated Sunday calls and words of encouragement. We would love to hear from you so we can lift you up. Before I go any further, because I believe we have to bathe everything that we do in prayer, I'm going to ask that you would pray with me. Let us pray. O oh Lord our God, when I in awesome wonder consider all the works thy hands have made, I see the stars and I hear the rolling thunder, thy power throughout the universe displayed. Then sings my soul, my saving God to thee, how great thou art, how great thou art. Twice more and again, O oh God, that a few of your handmade servants come before you, knees bent and heads bowed, coming to give you our best praise. We know, God, we're not worthy to gather the crumbs from underneath your table because, God, we know of our sins and wickedness. God, truth be told, sometimes it seems like we're not even worthy of being counted in the number. But God, because of how you bless us in spite of us, how you keep us in spite of our shortcomings and our misgivings, God, for that alone, we tell you thank you. We ask you now, God, that as we go into this worshipful gathering, into this sermonic moment, into this time where we lift up who you are through Christ Jesus, that God, your spirit would just fall afresh on this place. We're praying, God, that you'll transform living rooms and kitchens, bedrooms and dining rooms, wherever we find ourselves at cars and workplaces, into sanctuaries, God, where your spirit might tabernacle with us as your people so we might be saved through the power of your words. Holy Spirit, fall on us in this place. 
God, we're grateful and anticipate you doing something in us, the likes of which the world has never seen. Move now, save, even deliver, and God will be ever so careful and ever so mindful to give your name praise, honor, and glory. In Jesus' name we pray, amen and amen. If you have your Bibles, I'm inviting you, Holy Spirit, you are welcome in this place to turn with me to the gospel recorded by St. Luke. St. Luke's gospel, Luke chapter number one, the gospel recorded by St. Luke chapter number one, commencing at verse 26, concluding at verse 38. St. Luke chapter number one, Luke the physician of the early church and traveling companion of the apostles, St. Luke chapter 20, 20, excuse me, St. Luke chapter number one, commencing at verse number 26. St. Luke chapter number one, verses 26 through 38 is our pericope, our text for sermonic thought and meditation. Because someone asked me on the past week, Reverend, why do you refer when preaching to the Gospels um, by putting the word saint in front of it, St. Matthew, St. John, St. Luke, or St. Mark? I figured I would take some time to very briefly explain the short version I was told by my pastor, um, the Reverend Dr. Ronnie E. Relston Sr., who's now blessed to be one of the bishops in the African Methodist Episcopal Church, that in today's society of such secularism and familiarity, that if we just say Matthew and John, people might think we're talking about one of our homeboys. And so by reminding people, by putting that saint in front of them, we're speaking to the holiness and the righteousness of God's word that can be found in the text as recorded by these individuals. St. Luke chapter number one, commencing at verse 26, is our brick of people. Reading from the New International Version, your version might be slightly different. However, as long as it lifts up the name of Jesus, it is all right with me. There you will find these words. Once again, Holy Spirit, you are welcome in this place. In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, town in Galilee. The virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greeting, you who are highly favored, the Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his being the angel Gabriel's words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, do not be afraid. Mary, you have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son and you are to call him Jesus. He will be great and be called the son of the most high. The Lord will give him a throne of his father David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom shall have no end. How will this be? Mary asked the angel. Since I am a virgin, the angel answered, the Holy Spirit will come on you, and the power of the Most High God will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age. She who was said to be unable to conceive is in her sixth month. For no word from God will ever fail. Let me read that again to someone who is doubting what God said. For no word from God will ever fail. Verse 38, I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May your word to me be fulfilled. Then the angel left her. The grass withers and the flower fades. But the good news of the gospel is that the word of our God shall stand forever. Pray with me. Jesus, keep me near the cross. There is 
is a precious fountain. We won't move till you come. So holy whisper put on flesh, tabernacle now with us in this place. Hiding behind Calvary, old rugged cross. Allow the people to not see the mess that is Dominique Great, but see the God that is crucified in Christ Jesus. High and lifted up with your train filling the temple. God, I'm trusting you now for preaching. I've seen you work in others. Now, God, I'm asking that you might work in me. Do it again, God, so that that name might be glorified. Your people might be edified and the devil might be horrified. It's your servants pray. It's all I got. In Jesus' name. Amen. For all of the brief time that we have thus assembled my father's children, I want to use as the topic operations of the spirit. Operations of the Spirit. Holy Spirit, you are welcome in this place. My father's children, we gather on this fourth Sunday of Advent, preparing ourselves for what we celebrate on Christmas Day as the birth of the Christ child. In doing so, we are remembering and bringing back into our remembrance the significance of the events that took place more than 2,000 years ago, and I would argue even take place on today when God breathes hope into dead situations. Why would you go there, preacher, in the midst of a happy and merry season talking about things being dead because if truth be told, when we survey the landscape of what is going on around us in these United States of America, when we survey the landscape of everything that is going on in our world, we would find that long before COVID-19 reared its head, that we were doing some things that had us headed down a road of destruction. Yes, COVID-19 might be the latest thing that is consuming us and altering our lives, possibly for the worse and at times possibly for the better. But long before there was a COVID, there was still something in the world called sin that was seeking to separate us from the love of God that is found in Christ Jesus. There was still sin that found its ways to divide Republicans and Democrats. There was still a thing called sin that was manifesting itself in police brutality and school segregation and selective choosing of who we want to include versus exclude. Sin was present. Sin was breaking in and because of sin in the world. You and I, my father's children, need a savior. We need someone that can help us get past the issue of sin because sin will rush in and consume you like an overwhelming flood. I know we rely on Visa, MasterCard, and Discover. I know there are certain things Capital One, Chase, and Wells Fargo are able to do. 
I know there are certain things that she can do to you when she touches you in that spot or he licks you or kiss you right there, but I came by to let you know no matter what your baby and your boo might be doing for you, can't nobody still do you like Jesus. And in a world where things seem all out of alignment, where our money is funny, bills are due, we need a savior that can set us free. My father's children, in the text recorded by the physician Luke, I believe God wants us to understand the significance of Christ being birthed in this season. Not just the significance being birthed of Christ at the time where Quirinius might have been governor of Syria, not at the time when Augustus Caesar is the emperor of Rome, but what might God want us to know from the physician's gospel in the era of 2020 in the presidency of Donald Trump in the in-between where we have and have not in the midst of the best yet still worse the times in between my healing and my mess in between my breakthrough and my brokenness. What might God want us to know this holiday season? And I came by with a simple message from the Lord that God's spirit moves in strange and mysterious ways. My grandma would say the Lord moves in mysterious ways, but his wonders he is still yet to perform. We have to ask ourselves as we prepare to celebrate God breaking in his power through the birth of the Christ child, how can we find hope when it seems like all hope is gone. How do we find hope when we're on the verge of giving up? Truth be told, for some of us who are doing well, how do we keep the hope that we have so we can continue thriving as we move forward into new possibilities that are unknown? Jesus, through the physician's gospel, I believe, is letting us know several things. We find in the text, Mary, the mother of Christ receiving a word. My father's children, the first thing we have to do is if we want to prepare ourselves for God wants us to be and understand how the Spirit works in our lives, we have to be like Mary, willing to receive a word. The Bible says the word of God is a lamp unto my fat path and a light unto my feet. Why? Because the word can make crooked places straight. The word can smooth out rough edges. The word is able to prepare ways in the wilderness that declare the way of the Lord. The Bible teaches us that in the beginning was the word and the word was with God. And there was nothing aside from the word. It's the word that can set you free. Jesus, when he would go from being a babe to a grown adult in the midst of his prophetic ministry, would have an encounter with the centurion. See Matthew's gospel. And you'll learn all about how the centurion says, I'm able to send my men to and fro. You don't have to show up at my house. If you just speak the word, my daughter can be healed. My father's children, we have to get the word rooted in us. We have to be able to tell sickness when it comes to our door. Get me behind me, Satan, because the word says by your stripes I'm healed. We have to remember that though the enemy would seek to slay us, the word says, yet can we trust him? Why? Because everything still works together for good of them that love the Lord and are called according to God's purposes. We have to know in time when we feel by ourselves after the cessation of a relationship that might be over or perhaps the transitioning of a loved one that the word says God would never leave us nor forsake us. We need to remember that though our unemployment might not have been approved yet, that God said in the word that he would never leave the righteous forsaken nor his children begging for bread. We need the word. The word says the Lord is my shepherd. The word says ye though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. The word says God will set me free. Why? Because the word says who the son sets free is truly free indeed. Mary gets 
gets aware in the midst of her situation. Y'all, some of us are waiting for words to come from a new age, Gabriel. Some of us are waiting for the sky to crack open and the word of the answer to just fall on our laps. But yeah, I came by to say, you don't have to wait for Gabriel. You can find the word in the B-I-B-L-E because that's still the book for me. The word is what sets our life apart and it's by living according to the word we can deal with the things we're going through in our lives. Mary, when she gets the word, has a new attitude and mindset. Gabriel, in our text according to Luke, lets us know that Mary is going to have an experience that will transform her life. It's an experience that she didn't cause by virtue of anything she didn't hear me now. Some of us are having experiences in our lives that are being caused by virtue of nothing we did or did not do, some things we go through in this life because God is placing them there for one way or another and we might not understand it right now, but like the songwriter said, we will understand it better by and by. She gets this message that her life will be forever transformed by the birth of a child and I don't know how Mary's eyes were, but if you tell a virgin they're going to have a baby, they're probably going to lose it. Do not be afraid, Mary. You're going to have a child. You're going to call him Jesus. How will this be? The Spirit will come upon you. Now, Mary hears the word. And notice what Mary does second. She has to respond to what the word of God is telling her. My father's children, many of us know the word, but we're not necessarily responding appropriately to the word. This is an old saying that, I mean, it's such a half-truth. This whole idea that if you know better, you do better. And for some of us who got kids or know people, just because you know better does not mean you have to apply what you know. Mary hears the word and upon hearing the word, she has to do something with the information that she has received. One of the most difficult parts of life is having to choose how you are going to respond to all the information, to all the people, to all the different stimuli that are coming in your direction because the temptation, my father's children, is to get overwhelmed or to just float in the ocean praying that the wind will blow in the direction that God wants it to go. And y'all, I came by to say, it's all right to dip your oars in the water and help shape the direction that the wind is blowing the boat because if you just allow yourself to get tossed and turned on the rest of the seas of time that we call life, you will be lost. And God wants all of us to be saved. Mary responds to the word. She got some questions. Because y'all, when God tells us some things, as much as we would love to say, my heart and soul says, yes, Lord, yes, to your will. Y'all know we don't right away say yes. We ask God, oh, why you got to do it like that? Can it happen differently? And we don't like to talk about those things, but we inquire of God. And y'all, there's nothing wrong with inquiring of God. Why? Because any time you're spending time with the Lord, you're doing the right thing. Any time you choose to say, God, why me? Any time you have to ask yourself, God, why you? I've learned as long as the name of Jesus is coming out of your mouth, you can be saved. Mary asked a question, and the angel says, it will not happen by your own power. The change that will come over you and transform your life forever, you don't have the ability to handle. You don't have the ability to facilitate. You can't make it. The change I want to give to you has to come by the power of the Holy Ghost. 
Mary gets the Holy Ghost. And once she gets the Holy Ghost, it's the Holy Ghost that impregnates her. Y'all, if you don't respond to the power of the word by accepting the gift of God's spirit, you cannot, you will not be able to allow to nurture within your bosom, within your body and on your job the possibilities that will allow you to see the fullness of your breakthrough. We're wondering why we're struggling, wondering why we're still living paycheck to paycheck. And part of the answer might be because we've heard the word, we're hearers, but we're not doers. We're seeing, but we're not walking. And the Lord wants us to walk by faith and not by sight. You don't have to see the spirit to know that the spirit is in you. What you have to do is just trust the master of the seas. In response to hearing the word and then having to respond to the word, it puts Mary in a place where she's willing to trust God and her trust in God allows her to say, yes, I'm your servant. May the Lord's will be fulfilled in me. I don't know what you ultimately want to see happen and have accomplished in your life. I don't know if your aspirations are to be a teacher, a nurse, a lawyer, or a doctor. I don't know if you aspire to be the next two, three, or four star Michelin chef, whether or not you aspire to be the next Marriott Hotel franchise owner. I don't know if God is calling you to the ministry, but I came by to let you know whatever it is, you have to be willing to allow the Lord's work to be fulfilled in you. Part of what's weighing us down, part of what's burdening us, part of what's stressing us is we're dealing with this tension between where God wants us to be and where we want to be ourselves. And y'all, you can't have the spirit operating in your life while you still sit behind the driver's seat. At some point, you have to trust God to be the captain of your ship. At some point, you have to let go and allow God to take the wheel of the driver's seat. Why? Because when you do things by yourself, you cannot ultimately achieve what God wants you to do. And so we're invited to let go. Mary, on the precipice of new possibilities, she's been told that a change and great promise from God is coming her way. She has accepted what that promise means for her life. She heard the same thing that you and I heard, that we'll be blessed in the city and blessed in the field, blessed in our going in and blessed in the coming out. But here's the difference between us and Mary. When Mary fully surrenders, Mary doesn't look back. When Mary fully lets go, Mary never doubts. When Mary fully gives herself to God, she has a made up mind that for Christ she'll live and for Christ she'll die. That's why in the subsequent verses, after verse 38, Mary says, my soul magnifies the Lord and all that is within me because she is convinced that that which the Lord will do in her life even though she may not be able to fully explain it, even though it might cause others to talk about her, even though it might lead people to question the integrity of her virginity and possibly because of a throne Joseph to leave her, Mary realizes that anything God wants to do with her, it's all right and we'll work out. God wants to do some things in you, my father's children. But we're only giving God 20%. God wants to do some things in us, but we're only inviting God in after we've hit the last strike. Some of us are only inviting God in after everything else we've done has failed. And I came by on this 20th day of December. I came by on this last Sunday before we go into the holiday weekend 
to say that you can still let go of your sinful and wicked ways, that you can still release and turn over your stress to someone who's able to do something about your situation, that though you might be sick and you've been trying to lose weight by yourself, though you might be fighting in a relationship seemingly by yourself, Though you're on the verge of being evicted because you're not sure whether or not Congress will extend the moratorium under deferrals on rent and student loans, you don't have to bear your burdens by yourself. You can put your hands in the one that Mary burst in chapter 2. You can put your hands in the one that fled down into Egypt. You can put your hands in the one that will walk on water, turn water into wine. You can put your trust in a God that can heal you between his reach and his touch. You can put your trust in the one that tells storms that they have to be still and there's silence right away. You can put your trust in God who was living yet died, was crucified and died was buried and died but early rose so that when your faith was placed in him you too could be resurrected to new life. I don't know what you're standing in need of this Christmas season but I know this that if you try Jesus he is still all right, let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us of our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Have you